Hi, I'm Jesse Sterling, and welcome to another episode of Meetings with the Remarkable People. We are here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, with a very esteemed guest this week. He's a spiritual teacher. His followers include everyone from Jim Carrey to Oprah Winfrey. His game-changing, life-altering book, The Power of Now, was a New York Times bestseller, translated into 33 languages, and he's here with us today on the show. We're very, very pleased to welcome Mr. Eckhart Tolle. Thank you, sir, for doing the show. I guess the first question to dive in here for the viewers would be, what is the power of now? Well, the power of now, uh, the title of the book uh, that came to me while I was writing the book, uh, points to a fact that uh, many, many people continuously overlook and that is that uh, life is always now. Uh, this seems almost too obvious to state, but uh, most people live in a way that almost contradicts the simple fact that life is always now. They live as if some future moment were more important than this moment. So most people always live towards the next moment. They're always on their way towards the next moment. So, or if they are very, if they get very old, then usually they live in the past and they still don't live in the present moment. So we're not talking here about uh, making plans and on a practical level, all this is necessary and great, making plans, what to do with your life or what to do the next day or make a point appointments for the future, that's all fine. But most people uh, are never uh, uh, at home in the present moment. There's always something missing. There's an, in, there's an inner feeling that I need, need to get to the next moment where I will find some kind of completion or fulfillment. But when they get to the next moment, again, another next moment appears that they need to get to. So there's first of all the simple fact that life is always now. So we can learn instead of continuously uh, ignoring uh, the present moment, we can first of all realize the amazing fact that your entire life is experienced in and as the present moment. Life is never not the present moment. So it's the most precious thing we have. It's, we could say it's the only thing we have because the future, what we call the future, never actually comes. Nobody has ever experienced the future because the moment the so-called future comes, we experience it as the present moment. Mm -hmm. Again, the past, when we talk or think about the past, we can only do that in the present moment. So even thinking about the past and thinking about future, it ultimately happens in the present moment. Now, uh, what we, when we are always mentally projecting forward into the next moment, we miss the aliveness and vitality of this moment, which is ultimately all there ever is. I think it's an amazing realization that uh, many, many people never actually get to a place where they are able to, except for brief moments, where they're able to uh, come uh, into a, a good relationship with the present moment. It's amazing, there are millions of people on the planet who live in an almost antagonistic relationship with the present moment. They, they don't, they don't uh, want to be where they are, they'd rather be somewhere else. They may be in, engaged in some kind of activity, but they'd rather be doing something else, or they'd rather be already at the end of this particular activity. Uh, they may be with somebody, but they don't really want to be with them. They'd rather be somewhere else. Uh, you know the bumper sticker on some cars that says oh, it's like things like, I'd rather be golfing. 
uh, I'd rather be fishing. Mm -hmm. um, so there is this um, strange fact that uh, the present moment is treated by, in, by people internally either as antagonistic, I just need to get, get to some better moment, or as a means to an end. It's always a means to an end. So when you are engaged in an activity, you're already mentally projecting yourself to the next moment where the activity comes to an end, mm -hmm. or whatever you want to achieve through the activity. So uh, it's like uh, being on a journey and all mentally projecting yourself to the destination and not realizing that the journey takes, let's say you're on a journey, uh, it takes a week. Arriving at the destination is a one brief moment and there you are. It takes one week to get there. But if you uh, reduce the value of the steps that you are taking in this moment, if you reduce that to always a, only a means to an end, then the, your entire life becomes a means to an end, mm -hmm. an end that never really arrives. Because when you arrive at that moment, then something else immediately pops up that you need to reach. So it's particularly uh, developed in, in Western society, and but also some parts of the East, this inability to uh, become to be friendly with the present moment mm. because people think uh, if they are not stressed then they are not taking responsibility for their lives mm. uh, but the opposite is actually true it can be an amazing realization that uh, a person suddenly realizes that they've lived for the past 20 or 30 years uh, always looking for, for the next thing, never being able to actually enjoy the present moment, except for brief moments when sometimes uh, you get, you have a good meal and you feel, there's a feeling of fullness and then you have, uh, for a short period of time you feel okay. Now why is it that, that people cannot, cannot be internally aligned with the present moment and why is it that they find it so difficult to make the present moment their friend, as I call it, rather than their enemy. This little thing is very important. Make the present moment your friend rather than the, your enemy uh, and you'll be amazed how many people without knowing it unconsciously make the present moment into a kind of enemy. Uh, so, and that is a very dysfunctional way to live. Uh, then everything becomes a means to an end, an end that never arrives. Mm -hmm. Every relationship, when you meet another human being, even that human being then becomes to a, means to a means to an end because you want to achieve something through this human being. So uh, it reduces life to something that is no longer enjoyable. Uh, it takes away from the aliveness of life and uh, it reduces the quality of your life. So if you make the present moment your friend, then uh, you experience life in a different way. You're still able to make plans, but you're not continuously mentally projecting yourself away from here and now which happens, for example, whenever you're engaged in mind activity, you're engaged in thinking about what's going to happen. Worry is a typical way of um, the mind continuously pl playing out thoughts about things that might go wrong, that things that might you might lose, that you might not attain. The dangerous situation that you're imagining, people wake up in the middle of the night in a state of almost panic or fear. They're in a nice and warm bed, and yet their mind is telling them that they're in a critical situation, which is not the case. It's imagined through uncontrolled mind activity. 
and then they experience the emotions that they would experience if they actually were in a critical situation. Uh, so th that's it's a very dysfunctional way to live. And why is it that that people cannot seemingly find it so difficult to be internally aligned with the present moment, which after all is all you ever have. There is never anything else in your life but the present moment. You cannot experience anything, feel anything, do anything, think anything that is not happening in the space of now. It's all there ever is. Why, why are we as humans so addicted to these mental gymnastics of worrying about the future, feeling regret about the past? Is it just our nature, is how we were built, the neurons in our brain, or do we become addicted to thinking and worry? It's how the, uh, the human mind has developed. The ability to think, of course, was a wonderful evolutionary achievement. Uh, it, it is associated uh, also, it's linked to the development of language too. So gradually humans develop the ability to think and uh, it was a wonderful evolutionary, uh, evolutionary advance. But over, the, over many, many millennia, uh, the, the thinking activity uh, began to take over. And so most human beings these days n actually never stop thinking, uh, so what they experience is what I call a voice in the head, which is the internal dialogue that most people uh, experience, experience throughout the day uh, during their waking hours. There's this continuous inner uh, dialogue taking place, monologue, dialogue, whatever you want to call it. There's a, there's a commentator in, the, in your mind that interprets immediately and judges situations and people and, and thinks, uh, it, it spends much more time thinking about some other moment rather than this one, and usually it's the future. Uh, and, and some people, of course, dwell uh, excessively on the past too. They carry around the burden of past in their minds and in, and in their emotional field without knowing it, without realizing that it doesn't have to be that way, without realizing that uh, they are allowing the past, which after all is only certain thoughts that they carry in their head, they are allowing the past to, uh, to sabotage their whole life. They're carrying such a burden of past that they can no longer experience the present. So you're either burdened by the past or you're burdened by the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, the question of why is very important. What, what, is, what is the, the ultimate cause of this? And that is uh, the, what one could call overthinking. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking was a wonderful thing and still is a wonderful thing, but it has taken over human beings. It has uh, proliferated to such an extent that now thinking has become almost a, uh, an, a parasitical entity that lives in your, in your head that uh, uh, won't leave you alone. <laughs> you know, most people's sense of identity, most people's sense of who they are is um, bound up with their mind activity, with their thinking. So they derive their sense of self from certain stories that they're telling themselves in their mind. And that's to do with what happened in the past, what other people did to you, things you identify with, that these are uh, thoughts, things that belong to me, these are my things, these are all thought formations. Mm. So people identify with the voice in the head and the voice in the head becomes um, uh, for them impossible to, di to distinguish from who they are. Mm. So they talk to themselves in the head. You, everybody has met people in the street who talk to themselves out aloud and usually you, people look at them and say, oh, there's a crazy person going. 
but virtually everybody does that except that they don't do it out aloud. Mm -hmm. If you could listen into, when if you look, walk around in the city, if you could listen to, to what, what's going on in people's heads, you would realize they're all talking to themselves. A lot of chatter. <laughs> yes, and they are so identified with it that they, they kind of, they are it. The voice has taken you over. The, 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 the mind activity, the conceptual mind has taken you over and then it becomes, virtually becomes you. So in that state, which in spiritual terms we call unconscious, mm. when we use the word unconscious in, uh, in spiritual terms, it does not have the same meaning as, as it has in conventional terms. Usually when we use unconscious in conventional terms, we're talking about somebody who is just dropped off, he's unconscious. When we use the word unconscious in spiritual terms, it means, it refers to somebody who is totally identified with the stream, the continu continuous stream of thinking which is conditioned by the past. Mm -hmm. The types of thoughts that you think, the stories that you continuously revive in your head, are, ha have been conditioned by your past and the past of the culture that you grew up in, the country you grew up in, all the things that make up your past, your personal past and the collective past of your uh, environment. So a person who grew up in, let's say, Saudi Arabia will not be thinking the, the, the same kind of stories and will not interpret the world in the same way as somebody who uh, grew up uh, in Canada or in the West. But what they have in common they are both identified with the continuous stream of thinking. They may be different stories, they may be a different sense of identity, but, but in both cases they, are, they, they, cannot, they cannot separate themselves from the voice in the head. So the voice in the head has taken them over, which means thinking has taken you over uh, and that is, spiritually speaking, the unconscious state. And when you're always thinking, then it's very hard to be in the present moment because thinking is a, your whole life becomes reduced to concepts. Mm. And the, the heaviest concepts are concepts of past and future. Uh, now, an interesting fact is that in your immediate experience, uh, you have never experienced the future or the, the past. You have never, nobody can experience the future or the past. Because, because movies in your head. Yes, yeah. they, are, they are movies in your head. So ultimately, although we need future and past for practical purposes, of course we learn things from the past, we make plans for the future, this is, that's a good thing. Uh, but to be completely taken over by that and uh, derive our sense of identity from this mind activity that is always somewhere else, yeah. that is a, a, a huge um, uh, handicap on your... your um, it's a dysfunction in, uh, that is so common that people don't even realize that it is a dysfunction. It's a dysfunctional way to live. So what we call, we could call spiritual awakening. Uh, sometimes people think spiritual awakening happens when you see angels or you have a vision or something like that, or that spiritual awakening means that you suddenly have a new belief system that is spiritual, where you think about God all the time, mm -hmm. but it's nothing, that is nothing to do with real spiritual awakening. The, the true spiritual awakening is the moment when you realize that you are not your thoughts. Your thoughts are happening in your field of consciousness, yes, but they are not who you are. And that is an amazing realization for many people. And when they realize that, uh, something becomes activated in you, in your field of consciousness, 
that we could call a different dimension of consciousness, where you're able, to, from that dimension, you're able to be aware of thoughts that you're having, but you're not the thoughts anymore. For example, you may, be, you may suddenly become aware that for many years you've been uh, um, trapped in uh, certain types of very negative thinking. Um, people suddenly realize they have repetitive thoughts that go through their heads um, every day, and they were so identified, that was their reality. When I was, I was very negative when I was in my younger years and in, up in my 20s. And uh, for example, one thought uh, that I often had in my mind whenever something went wrong, where the thought came in, of course, bad things always happen to you. I was talking to myself, mm -hmm. to you. So there has a kind of dialogue. Of course, bad things always are bound to happen to you. It's all, always the same, isn't it? Life always does it to you. And I was so identified with that thought, I believed in it, and it produced not very pleasant emotions. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I became very depressed. I spent several years in deep depression mm -hmm. and anxiety, and I didn't realize that the depression and the anxiety was not caused by situations in my life, ultimately, or I thought it was, because there was insecurity. What am I going to do? And I don't have a relationship. I need to I need to find a woman, but I can't find one with all these problems that a young person has. <laughs> but I didn't realize that all the problems the, of my life, the and what I felt about it, the the emotions that I was feeling, they were not pleasant. They were ultimately not caused by what, what my life situation, they were ultimately caused by the way in which I interpreted mentally my life situation. Uh, and this is an amazing thing um, if uh, the viewers here only take away one thing from our conversation and something that there's nothing here that you need to believe in. True spirituality is beyond belief. It has nothing to do with changing your belief systems because that just means changing the thoughts that you think. Mm -hmm. Spirituality means discovering that uh, there is another dimension of consciousness in you, which we could call awareness. I sometimes call it presence. Um, there's a term that's been, become quite popular these days, and that is mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't use the term. It's a, it's a lovely thing. It points to the same thing, but I don't use the term mindfulness because the word itself seems to imply that your mind is full. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, th discovering then that uh, a lot of the unhappiness that you experience in your life, and unhappiness, I'm using that, that as a generic term, Unhappiness can be a little thing like a slight irritation when, you, when you're waiting in line at the supermarket and the line is not, not moving. The, a slight irritation arises. That's already a, a small form of unhappiness. Or you can have extreme unhappiness uh, when you, you arrive ho home after your shopping trip to the supermarket and you suddenly see your house has gone up in flames. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit more unhappiness. But the, the mechanism is the same. Now for most people, most people go, go through their daily lives experiencing uh, many times forms of upset and irritation and anger. Uh, this is quite normal. And other people carry and have an undercurrent of discontent and unease in their lives, which is a mild form of unhappiness, mm -hmm. residual unhappiness. There is an undercurrent, and they may not even know it. But I invite anybody to experiment with this, and next time you're in a situation that either upsets you, or makes you angry, or irritates you, to ask yourself, how does this upset or this irritation arise? How, how is it caused? For example, you may be standing at, okay, let's go back to that very simple situation. 
it's sometimes good to start with very simple situations because the mechanism is always the same, whether it's a, 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 a small, seemingly insignificant form of unhappiness or a huge manifestation of unhappiness. The, the, the mechanism that creates unhappiness is this, always the same. So you're, in, you're standing in line in the supermarket and you get really irritated why about the, the check at the cashier who is too slow and is having a conversation with that person and the, this, the whole setup isn't working, how awful it is, and you've got, I don't, I don't have enough time for the, the dialogue in your head creates, the dialogue that tells you that this is a bad situation creates an emotion that reflects that kind of thought, that, uh, these kinds of thoughts. And then you ask yourself, how would I experience this situation if I did not add the dialogue or the monologue to it? If I, did, if I simply took this situation for what it is without adding mental dialogue to it, without adding mental negative interpretation to it because it, it makes no difference. It doesn't change the situation. There's no possibility of action. If there's a possibility of action, then of course you can take action. That's a different matter. Mm. And then you, you might experience for the first time being in exactly the same situation that, that you recognize as the isness of the present moment. And th then you become uh, at ease with the isness of the present moment and do not add unnecessary baggage, mental baggage, to the simple and ultimately neutral isness of the present moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have separated yourself from your conditioned thinking, the voice in the head, and suddenly you see, oh, this is actually, it just is. I'm breathing. And, and you may even, as, because this will, this will bring about a, a brief cessation in this mental noise when you come to accept this moment as it is because you realize eh, it, many times there's not much you can do right now. You can only say, well, this is what is right now. Mm -hmm. If action is possible, of course, you take action if it's possible or necessary. So you come into an alignment with the present moment and you realize you're now able to separate an external situation from your mental interpretation of the external, especially negative interpretation of the external situation. That actually there is no problem in each present moment. No. It's your own mental expectations yes. and imaginations and preferences yes. causing you agitation. Yes. And that is quite a realization that uh, you, there's so uh, the possibility of freedom uh, arises. Uh, your inner state does not have to be totally determined by external conditions. You're not at the mercy any longer of external conditions, which means, for example, also people. Some people are. I mean, people are very problematic. Uh, people, <laughs> people. <laughs> uh, uh, so, somebody is rude to you, or somebody fails to do something that they should do or should have done. All kinds of things that you can complain about in people's behavior. <laughs> and uh, a lot of the complaining that one does about other people is totally futile. It does not change them. Because you, 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 when you talk to others about them, you say, well, do you know what he did? And then he said, and then he did that. Oh my God, he did that. <laughs> or you do it in your head. It's all futile, it does not change that person. So uh, if somebody is rude to you, like, oh, he, he doesn't, you're carrying your, let's go, or it's in the supermarket, you're carrying your shopping and somebody slams the door on your face because does, is rude. Uh, for many people, the, the triggers can trigger a train of negative thoughts that, that lasts for the next 10, 15, or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that means, and if you're completely identified with the stream of thinking, you don't even know, you think you're now experiencing a bad reality. You do, you, because you have not taken a, you have not taken a step back from your thinking, 
you have not become aware of your thinking. You are so in your thoughts that you are totally identified with the thoughts. So the the key then is to to uh, be able to separate your your mental interpretation of things from the simplicity of the isness of the present moment. So you don't add unnecessary suffering to situations. You no longer create unnecessary suffering for yourself because you realize the unhappiness that you're experiencing in a given situation in 90% of the cases is not produced by the situation, it is produced by the way in which your mind tells a story about the situation. It's the voice in the head that creates a large part of your unhappiness. And that's quite a realization. And that applies to small situations, it applies to bigger situations too. And some people uh, live with a um, a very a critical and very negative voice in their head for years. They live with some, they criticize themselves continuously, some of them, or they criticize continuously other people and situations. There's always something wrong with wrong with me or with the situation. Or they tell themselves stories of how how bad, bad my life is. How unfairly I've been treated by life and other people, and it's I, have, I wasn't given a chance, and now it's all over. It is no point in even. I'm too old now to. It could very people carry very unhappy stories around in their head, mm -hmm. and they call that my life. There are not that many people who are, are really happy with their lives. There are more people around who are unhappy with their lives. My life didn't go the way it was meant to go. It didn't go the way I was expecting it to go. Things, many things went wrong. And so people carry unhappy stories and they, they, they derive their sense of identity from the unhappy story. Not realizing that it's an unhappy story, they call it me and my life. So that is a... <laughs> Uh, and nobody, nobody has pointed out to them that this is not, it does not have to be that way. You can, you, you can become aware of the stories that you're telling yourself, the stories that give you your sense of your unhappy sense of self, uh, the, and realize that is, these are certain thoughts. I call it thoughts that create what we call your life situation. Mm -hmm. Your life situation, the, your past and your so-called future. My, and there's no life situation that is not problematic. Everybody has their set of problems. Mm -hmm. Every life situation has its difficulties and its problems. If it's not one thing, it's another. You cannot go through life without experiencing almost continuously. I do, I, Problems, or my, the word that I prefer is challenges. You cannot go through life without continuously experiencing challenges, either of interpersonal relationship challenges, close relationship challenges, health challenges, physical challenges, financial challenges, professional work challenges, living situation challenges. There's always something that goes wrong somewhere. <laughs> so that's only to be expected. But this does not have to, have to become, evolve into an unhappy story of me and my life. So you, you, you are able to differentiate between the story of my life, my so-called life, the, my life situation, in my, and life. So in The Power of Now, I write about the importance of distinguishing between what you what is your life situation, which includes all your, your problems and your past and all those things, that's fine, that exists. But in addition to your life situation, which exists in time, past and future, there's something more vital and uh, I call that your life. Now, 
Your life situation, as I said, exists in time, but your life is now. So if your attention moves into the present moment, it's a little bit like waking up out of this dream of continuous thinking, useless thinking, not, not constructive thinking, useless thinking that tells you how unhappy you are. So that kind of thinking that creates an unhappy, fictitious mental entity that you think is you, useless thinking. You step out of that, which is almost like a dream of, of a hypnotic trance of useless thinking. You step out of that and suddenly it's a bit like somebody who's waking up from a dream. And this is why use, we use spiritually, we, op, we use the term awakening. It's used in many traditions, mm -hmm. spiritual awakening. You wake up out of this stream of thinking into the present moment. So uh, you suddenly become alert. And a moment ago, you were still thinking about how awful your life is. That's your life situation. Maybe it is awful. <laughs> but that's an interpretation. There's your life situation. What about your life? What do you mean by life? Well, this moment is your life. It always Your life is always this moment. Is there anything wrong with this moment? A question I ask in the power of now. What is your problem right now? If you're re really present, because and, uh, you come into the present moment, which, which is all there ever is. And in this present moment, what is your problem? And then you have to wake, really wake up into the present moment and see, well, right now I'm breathing, I'm sitting here and I'm looking around and I'm seeing a bit of sky and I'm seeing a potted plant and I'm seeing the flowers. It's all quite lovely and it's relatively quiet here. The temperature is fine. And I may even feel that I'm, there's, there's an aliveness in my body. I breathe and I feel alive. There is, every cell is alive. I call it the inner body awareness. You become aware that uh, you are alive in your body. Mm -hmm. So you're stepping out of your mind. You're stepping into sense perceptions. Come to your senses. And you also come into your body. And then you're, in the, you're now in the present moment. That's your life. And yes, of course, you have to deal with the stuff in your life situation, but not be lost in it. You deal with it when the moment comes when you're able to t take action or do something, then you deal with it. But you're no longer lost in it, and you're no longer completely absorbed by, by, by this unhappy pseudo-identity that, that's created by useless thinking. So you come into the present moment, this is your life. And the rest is your life situation. And then after a while you're able to balance your dealing with your life situation and, and experiencing life directly. And, and then, then a beginning to appreciate the present moment and realizing that is actually quite wonderful. In this present moment, there's no problem. And what a remarkable journey you've taken us on. You're not your thinking. You are the awareness discerning those thoughts. And unbelievably, we're already at that point in our talk where we're winding down. We just have a couple minutes left. So I'm wondering if there's some final thoughts you have for our viewers out there across Canada and around the world how to get out of your thinking and into that state of awareness? Well, first, uh, the recognition that a lot of the thinking that you do, or rather you don't do it, a lot of the thinking that happens to you, because people say, I think, but really thinking happens to them mm -hmm. in the same way, I mean, the heartbeat happens to you too, so you don't see, I beat my heart. Mm -hmm. The heartbeat happens to you. So thinking happens to people. And then if you first of all realize a lot of the thinking is not only uh, useless, but actually destructive, uh, huge amounts of negative thinking about yourself and life and so on. Uh, things like also regret, 
and resentment, thinking about the past, anxiety, worry, thinking, ex excessive thinking about the future, excessive thinking about the past. So this overthinking, as we could call it, you realize the futility of it. In, in the moment that it happens, you can say, oh, do I want this? Do, do I want to make myself unhappy? And you begin to realize, here's the situation, and here's my negative thinking about it. Do I want this? No, life would be more pleasant without it. And then you begin to realize, okay, I'm going to let go of that. And by choice, we come more into the present moment. You choose to come to your senses, to look around, to take a breath, two or three conscious breaths. And you, so you enter the present moment and you can feel the qualitative difference between being absorbed in useless thinking and being, being present in the now. And so the, the term I use that might be helpful is ask yourself, what is your relationship with the present moment at any given time? What is my relationship with the present moment? Am I totally ignoring it? Am I making it into a means to an end? Am I making it into an enemy? Mm -hmm. Or am I making it into a friend? And then you will see that the qual there's a huge qualitative difference if you make the present moment into a friend rather than an enemy. So you become friendly with the isness of things. You no longer argue that much with things that happen, and especially things that, that before you were, would have found upsetting, because you might have noticed that life is full of things that seem to uh, be obstacles on, the, on your path of where you want to go. Life does that to you. It puts, seemingly, it puts obstacles in your path. And instead of complaining when things don't go the way you expect them to go, uh, you immediately come into an inner alignment with what is, and then you see what action you can take, rather than, than complaining or becoming angry or upset with what, what is. You align yourself with life, which is always now. And the, the, the amazing thing is that then life, you begin to experience, if you live in that way, you begin to experience that the, uh, a more harmonious flow to your life that, and you actually, this sounds almost um, magical, that uh, you experience, you begin to experience circumstances as more helpful rather than antagonistic. Why? Because life reflects back to you the, what you, what, your attitude towards life is reflected back to you as events. Mm. So if your attitude is accepting and friendly with the present moment, then you're more likely to attract uh, pleasant circumstances. Not that life will not challenge you again, it still does that, but that's okay. The challenges then no, no longer produce unhappiness in you. They are just seen for what they are, and, the, and then you do what you can do. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your generosity of time, your generosity of spirit. I wish you best of luck on your upcoming tour across Canada.